We start this series on preprocessor with something that was not much better than a SED script. We added programmability, stack, and the ability to make jumps and loops. And I have to admit, I added file inclusion because it was something cool to do. But before we dive into that, I've got to explain how 40H reads and parses text files. And for that I have to introduce you to a chunk of memory that is vital in this process. It's called the TIP, which stands for Terminal Input Buffer. Every fort has one. Its purpose is to store anything you type from the terminal. There's also a pointer. Initially it's pointing to the beginning of the TIP. The value of this pointer is stored in a variable called IN. Initially it holds zero. But when we issue a word like parse or password, it will increment, pointing to the position just after the token we parsed. But as you might know by now, 40H is different. 40H uses the tip for reading text files. When refill is called, it reads an entire line from the text file and places it in the tip. If a line is too long, it simply reads up to the full capacity of the tip and reach the remainder on the next call to refill. But you can parse the tip as easily as if you typed in the line yourself. Since 48 files are simple text files, we don't need to look any further. That's how things are read. Now, how do we handle include files? It's important to know that a file is included by either include or the bracket needs directive. When a file is opened, even the initial source file, some basic information is stored in a structure. First, the file name itself. Second, what kind of file it is. This information is derived from its extension. We all know ordinary source files, but in Ford there are also so-called block files. Every line in a block file has a fixed 64 characters length and is padded by spaces when required. The preprocessor can handle both. Now the file is opened, we can begin to read and parse it. When the include directive is encountered, we save the entire tip in the same structure, along with the value of in. Finally, just before we close the file, we get the current position of the file pointer. Now we can close the file, and repeat the same procedure for the newly opened include file. It's that simple. Now at a certain point the include file has been completely parsed. We're at end of file and we need to return to the original file. We close the include file and free the structure. Then we retrieve the file name and open the original file. After that we get the position from the structure and set the file pointer accordingly. We also select the file reading routine. After that we restore the tip. And finally, we get the value of in. That will allow us to resume parsing at the exact position where we left off. And that, folks, is how it's done. What we actually created is a stack of structures. You have a source file that includes a file, which in turn includes another file and so on. Up to 32 levels deep. But frankly, that's really some nesting. I bet the vast majority of 48 sources don't even nest four levels deep. And because it's a stack, structures can be taken from the stack as well with little effort. When you do fort, you will find that stacks are surprisingly useful. It may surprise you that this functionality is duplicated in 40H, since the regular compiler supports include files as well. But it processes them in a completely different way. The open fort routine creates a tiny piece of source code in memory that effectively includes the main file. That loads the main file into memory. If this main file contains an include statement, it moves the second half of the main file down in memory and uses the freed up space to include this file. If that file also contains an include statement, it performs the same trick again. So why are they different? It depends on how the files are processed. The preprocessor processes files line by line, and the compiler processes files in their entirety. So consequently, they use different file inclusion methods. 
But why? Why do both programs handle the very same functionality? That's easy. First, I thought it was a cool thing to do. Darn. If I'd had a bulletproof idea how to support conditional compilation, I'd added that to the preprocessor as well. Second, the 40H compiler was there first. And it was the first to support file inclusion. Could I have stripped that functionality from the 40H compiler? Yes. But then I'd have to pass everything through the preprocessor. And I didn't like that idea. It would defeat 48's primary purpose, and that is to serve as an application-specific scripting language. Because, yes, that's what it is. That people like it as a standalone language is an entirely different story. Finally, it's proven to be so useful. I can just include a file with a bunch of macros, or a file utilizing these macros, and it works. Without it, the entire Ford object orientation system would not have been possible. FOS has now even got its own libraries, where entire classes can be loaded, defining data structures like lists, dynamic strings, streams and vectors. It opened up an entire OO ecosystem. Without file inclusion, all that would not have been possible. So frankly, I'm glad I did. And now for something completely different. This is an implementation of the classic Moonlander program. You'll notice that all the code describing its behavior has been fortified. The original formulas have been lost. Wouldn't it be nice if we could retain those, like this? Actually, uh, with the preprocessor you can. This program can be compiled and run as as is. Yes, the preprocessor supports an infix to postfix converter. All you have to do is proceed the formula in question with the word let, just like basic. It's quite a formidable converter. It supports single cell arithmetic, double cell arithmetic and floating point. You can select the mode required by issuing a single, double or floater directive. I didn't write this library myself. It was submitted by one of my most valued users, and we spent quite some time integrating it into the preprocessor. But the result is there. You'll find the preprocessor as a standalone program in the 40H distribution, and since preprocessor programs have their own extension, .4pp, you can use a little makefile to compile preprocessor programs. But there's also an executable version. And that one can do a whole lot more. It will recognize preprocessor programs and transparently invoke the preprocessor where required. And no, you won't need the preprocessor script. 40As allows you to create bytecode that can be embedded in any C program. And that's just what we did here. When the preprocessor is invoked, its bytecode is loaded into memory and executed by the standard 40H VM. The resulting intermediate file is presented to the compiler and deleted afterwards. The preprocessor simply returns its status to the main program, which takes care of all error handling. Note that all the memory the bytecode occupies is freed when it exits. Is this the end? Yep, this is the end. I hope you enjoyed our extended tour of the 40H preprocessor. Please subscribe if you liked it. And I'll see you next time. Anyway, I'm Hans Bezemer and this was Back and Forth.